Hi, everyone, and welcome back to our next episode of Rewalk's Topics in Neurorehabilitation webcast. I'm Kathleen O'Donnell, and today we'll be talking with Nassim Chadiwala. I first met Nassim back in the early days of Exosuits when she attended a feedback session I hosted for local therapists to provide input and feedback on some of our earliest prototypes. Nassim is a board certified neuroclinical specialist and a certified vestibular clinical specialist who has more than 20 years of experience as a physical therapist treating a variety of complex neurodiagnoses. She works at the Clow Family Center for Rehabilitative and Sports Therapies at Emerson Hospital and somehow finds time to also work as an adjunct teaching faculty member at the MGH Institute of Health Professions and the UMass Lowell Physical Therapy Program, as well as being a course developer and instructor for Summit Professional Education's Stroke Recovery and Vestibular Rehabilitation courses. Today's talk will focus on identifying the key elements of GATE and how they inform her strategies for GATE training and neural rehabilitation. Hi, Nassim. It's great to talk with you today. Hi, thank you so much for your introduction. So thank you, Kathleen, for inviting me. And um, I am very excited about this topic. I feel GATE, like as physical therapists, it's one of the biggest key factors that patients want. Like most times, especially in neural recovery, one of the important goal is I want to walk. And if patients can walk, I want to walk better. And sometimes the sky is the limit. Like they, GATE is a goal that we can always, always work for any individual at any point in time. So when we look at GATE, I'm just kind of, I like to put this video up because most times when we do observational GATE analysis, we are looking at walking in terms of identifying what impairment the patients have and how best can we prioritize our treatment because at the end of the day, when we're working as physical therapists, we are thinking about efficiency of our treatments and we want to do the best possible thing in the least possible time and get the best outcomes as soon as we can. So when we are looking for gait in these patients, we sometimes tend to look at swing phase of the gait because I find swing phase to be very dramatic phase. And so as you're looking at these videos, you might be thinking, okay, okay there is circumduction going on. There is uh, poor hip deflection going on. Uh, a lot of energy is spent into the picking that leg up and putting it down. But if we look at the stance phase of the gait, and we'll talk about it a little bit more as we get into this gait mechanics and uh, kinetics of how things move, I always find in my pet peeve is really look at the stance phase of the gait because I find when we do interventions which address the stance phase of the gait, it really helps increase the efficiency of the gait. So let's talk about gait. And going back to our basics, understanding the gait, we know that we have three main components of the gait. And the first component is weight acceptance. The second component is the single limb support part. And then the third component is the limb advancement. And together, all these three components help with locomotion because locomotion is trying to get from one point to another point on our two feet. So some of the key features that help us with gait are, we need to keep upright posture. It's very, very important. And the reason that upright posture is very important is, I think about locomotion as a two-part process. So our upper body, head, trunk and our hands, upper limbs, they are like the parcel. They just go along and our legs, they are the locomotion. They take this parcel along with them. So if this parcel stays upright and straight and free flowingly moves with both the legs, for the legs, it becomes much easier to take this parcel with them. But if you think about it, you have a patient with stroke and the hand is like somewhere here, or if you have this older gentleman whose head is like five inches away from the body, or you have somebody who has kyphoscoliosis and their trunk is in a different plane, then what you're doing is this parcel is not moving in a synchronized coordinated way with the lower extremity. So the lower extremity is putting as much energy to move this parcel along. So that upright posture, I, I find that as a foundation to gait training. Then second is generating propulsive forces. So again, locomotion, as I said, is moving from one part to the other side, right? So we need to have that propulsion because if we don't have propulsion, 
it's very hard for us to generate those forces to keep going. And sometimes you might have patients where that initial first few steps might be hard, but once they keep going, that propulsion steps in and they are able to go. Uh, we see this in kids, when the kids are learning to walk, right? That first step is hard, but as they take the first step and then they just start running around and then they flop down, right? The next key feature of gait is shock absorption. Again, this is a very key ingredient to locomotion. And the shock absorption mainly happens during the stance phase, which is the initial contact. We have our plantar flexors that help us with shock absorption. And then during mid stance, that's when we have knee flexion. And that five degrees of knee flexion during mid stance is a critical event because it helps us with that shock absorption. And the last key feature, the most important one, is energy conservation. Because if you think about gait and how much energy we spend, if you're spending a lot of energy, then we get tired very fast and we are only able to walk short distances. But if we have good pattern of walking, we are able to walk at our self-selected space using our upright posture, propulsive forces, shock absorption mechanism, then our energy conservation is pretty good and we don't get tired as easily. So if you look at the gate, we have all these different phases of the gate and we can talk about them is a couple of stance phase of gate and then swing phase of gate. So the stance phase of gate where we start with initial contact, it used to be called as heel strike, but we don't call it heel strike anymore because we know that initial contact could happen with a variety of different uh, contacts with that contact surface. It doesn't always be the heel. And that's why the terminology has changed and we call it initial contact. So uh, I'm going to just take a little bit of deviation in talking about those phases of the gate and we'll talk about these rockers first and then we'll get into the stance phase and the swing phase of the gate. So the rockers, we have like three different rockers that help us during the stance phase of the gate. And these rockers help us from that initial stance to terminal stance. And rockers, the way I think about them are, these are our mechanical helpers in the gait cycle. So the first one is the heel rocker. And what the heel rocker does is, again, we're looking at those key elements of gait, right? We want energy conservation, we want upright posture, we want the way to move from one end to the other end in a nice efficient way. So as soon as on the initial contact, you bring the heel down and contacts the floor, the way the talus bone is, it acts as a rocker. So you land on that calcaneal and it moves your body forward. So it causes that propulsion for you. The other rocker that we have is the ankle rocker. And the ankle rocker is when we land on our heel, so the calcaneal comes in right here, and then we get into this mid stance. During mid stance, our foot pronates. And the pronation is very important because that brings the base of that first ray in contact with the contact surface and that adds as your second rocker. And what does that do? As soon as you get in contact with that, it helps you propel your force forward. So that second rocker is also very, very important. And then we have this third rocker. Some people call it third and fourth rocker. I just combine it and just call it one four foot or a two rocker. Now, this is really important in the final phase of the stance phase. So what happens in the terminal stance or the pre-swing phase is we're always talking about this toe extension needed up to around 35 degrees. And what that toe extension does is it puts the head of the metatarsal bone into the contact with the contact surface. And that acts as your third rocker. Same thing, when the weight hits there, it helps us propel forward. So all these three inbuilt rockers helps us just propel our weight from one end to the other end. And this is just the locomotor cycle. So these three rockers are really, really important. And I cannot tell you how many times patients, they don't get initial contact. So they never use the heel rocker. If they come in mid stance, they may lack pronation at the foot. And so that base of that first ray never gets in contact with the floor and they don't hit that second rocker. And how many times patients either have a callus or they have hallus valgus or they have pain 
or they have arthritis, gout. So, or they have limited range of motion in two extension. And that forbids them from using that toe rocker. So if your patients are not able to use these rockers, even though they may have that muscle power, the gait becomes inefficient. So we had these rocker shoes that came in, right? And first I thought, wow, the rocker shoes are going to do things for our patients where patients don't have the rockers. They'll wear these shoes and they'll go from one end to other end quickly. What happened? They failed. And the reason they failed was because it was a very good concept. I love the concept. But as soon as we landed on that hill, now our gate, the way the initial stands, the mid stands, it has to go in a certain way, in a certain timing. But what these shoes did is, as soon as you landed on that initial contact on the heel, it threw you off into pre-swing. And it was just too fast. And there were a number of falls that were reported with the use of these rocker shoes. And that's why uh, we are not using these shoes right now. Now, another mechanical point is gravitational vector line. And I'd really like to talk about it, understand this, because again, this is all mechanics. Um, my other pet peeve is we take about 5,000 steps a day. That's average. Most people could go up to 10,000, 15,000 steps a day. But we don't get tired at the end of the day if we have those regular 5,000 or 10,000 steps, right? And the reason is we have our muscles which switch on and off during the gait cycle. And the reason they are able to switch on and off during the gait cycle is because we have this rocker system that helps us, but we also have these gravitational vector forces that help us. And the gravitational vector forces, nothing. It's equal and opposite force generated because we are falling or throwing our weight on the floor. That's what we're trying to do is when our limb gets to the floor, we, it, it's fall. Our limb is falling to the floor. So we get that equal and opposite gravitational force that's generated getting back to our body. So during initial contact, that gravitational vector force is in front of that ankle joint. And this force which goes to our body is also in front of the knee joint and the hip joint. And what that gravitational vector force does, which is this first picture right here, is it causes knee extension momentum and it causes hip flexion momentum and it also helps to plantar flexion momentum. So this gravitational vector force really encourages us to use this knee extension that we need in mid stance. It allows us to have that hip flexion. Now, once we get into this mid stance, right over here, so this is the loading response. And then when we get into the mid stance, what happens is as our body weight is coming over our ankle joint, this gravitational vector line moves forward. And now in mid stance, it comes right slightly behind this knee joint and right slightly behind this hip joint, but in front of this ankle joint. So what does that cause? It's causing this knee extension. We might have five degrees of flexion there because that's a shock absorbing moment. But with the hip, when the gravitational vector line moves behind the hip, that's your hip extension. And that hip extension is really, really needed during this mid stance time because mid stance is also your time for single limb support. And this is when on your one leg, your single limb support, you're in mid stance while the other leg is off the ground. And we really need this hip extensors, hip abductor work. And so the gravitational vector line helps us with this. Now, what happens as we get into the terminal stance and into the pre-swing? Now, as we're keeping on moving forward, our weight is going forward and we are throwing that gravitational vector line almost to the forefoot. So what does that do? When it goes almost to the forefoot, it's really generating that gastroc power. It's in front of that knee joint, it's causing knee extension, but it's still behind that hip joint. So it helps with hip extension as well. Now, before when I said about that parcel and locomotion, right? If that parcel, your trunk, your upper extremity, your head, they're not free flowing, they're not moving with your lower extremity and they are staying way back, this gravitational vector line is not able to work at its optimum. And then that completely throws off our gait cycle. 
So really, really important to pay attention to this gravitational vector line on how it's moving. So when we are doing observational gate analysis, now, of course, uh, I'll talk about kinetics and kinematics, and we are not able to kinetically assess in our clinics. Uh, it needs labs. We need to throw in uh, EMGs, uh, electrodes. Uh, we need body sensor cameras. But if you just are able to look at how person is walking and able to see their weight transfer, at least we'll get some components of how this gravitational vector line is moving along. And I think that gives us good information in terms of when we design treatments for our patients. Again, we want to be the most efficient therapist. So we are trying to design these treatments addressing the gravitational vector line as well. All right, going back to the slide again. So I just wanted to kind of talk to you about those uh, rocker system gravitational vector line. And now let's talk about how initial contact loading response works, mid stance, terminal stance. So these are all your stance phase and pre-swing. And then the swing phase is where we have initial swing, mid swing and terminal swing. So weight acceptance, as I said, the first three, right? What happens with the gait is weight acceptance, single limb support, and then uh, propulsion. So the weight acceptance, we have two phases. So initial contact and loading response. And during the weight acceptance phase of it, we're talking more about stability part of it. So hip joint is really needed over here because we need the stability at the hip joint, the hip extensors, the hip abductors. And this also, uh, helps with prevention of unnecessary pelvic motion. So that's another thing is, you know, how we have that parcel and lower extremity. So we sometimes forget about that pelvis because the parcel is your head and your trunk and your upper extremities, um, your spinal um, column, and then your lower extremities are your propulsion. But then what does your pelvis do? Because your pelvis is the one that's connecting that movements, which are not moving as much, to these free moving lower extremities. So we really need to address pelvis during the weight acceptance part. Now, initial contact, what happens is dorsiflexion, we don't have any, so we are at neutral. But then in loading response, our ankle goes from neutral dorsiflexion into that plantar flexion. And again, that's an important part of this gait cycle because that helps with that initial vector line. Then we get into the single limb support time. And single limb support time is where we have the two phases again. We have the mid stance and the terminal stance. Now mid stance, I feel is a very important component of the gait cycle. And the critical event that happens over here is tibial advancement. So what happens in mid stance is initial contact, we came with our ankle neutral, loading response, we went with our ankle into plantar flexion, about five degrees, not much. And then during mid stance, what happens is your ankle is staying where it is, but your tibia kind of moves over your ankle. And that causes you to come into five degrees of dorsiflexion. And that's a very important part in the skate cycle. Now, who causes that dorsiflexion in ankle? It's a gastroxoleus muscle. So what the gastroc is doing is it's eccentrically controlling that tibia to come forward and it holds it there. So in mid stance, you have five degrees of knee flexion and that knee flexion is coming because of this gastroc muscle, which is eccentrically moving that tibia forward from underneath that femur. This is also the shock absorbing moment of the skate cycle. So a lot of times I'll have patients who may have knee hyperextension during gait cycle. And we always talk about knee hyperextension to be linked to inefficient quadricep muscles, spasticity in quadricep muscles, hip extensor, hip abductor, hamstring muscle. But the key component that we forget is the gastroc muscle. So the gastroc muscle is really, really important in controlling that tibia. And if the gastroc muscle is weak or spastic or we have a contracture in plantar flexion, it will not allow this tibia to come forward. So if the tibia can't come forward, what will it do? Go back and get into that genuric curvatum and stabilize the knee because all we need to do is stabilize on this foot so the other foot can take a step. 
And this is where we see a smaller step length on the contralateral limb. Terminal stance. Once we get through this mid stance, now a heel is coming off the ground. So that's where the terminal stance begins. So in terminal stance, we still have dorsiflexion. So from five degrees of dorsiflexion in mid stance, we go up to 10 degrees of dorsiflexion into terminal stance. Uh, followed by hip flexion and knee flexion, sorry. Hip extension, knee flexion. Now the single limb advancement stage, right? So we start with a pre-swing. And what happens with this pre-swing is our limb is still in contact with the floor, but it's going all the way forward. So here, the dorsiflexion that we had in terminal stance gets into plantar flexion, and we have about 10 degrees of plantar flexion. So if you think about ankle, and you think about the stance phase of the gait, it moves from neutral to plantar flexion, to dorsiflexion, to more dorsiflexion, to plantar flexion again. So there's a lot of components of this ankle and they are very, very important. And now if you think about your patients, how many patients don't have anything in the ankle when they're walking? And so if you don't have an ankle or it's fused or you don't have motion or you have spasticity, we are not getting all these components of this stance phase of the gait cycle. Um, initial swing, mid swing and terminal swing, we get knee flexion up to 60 degrees, mid swing, we have hip flexion, and then terminal swing as we are going to start landing on that leg again, we are preparing for knee extension in neutral. So I just have this slide to kind of walk through some of these important muscles and their importance in different phases of gait cycle. I'm not going to go through every muscle, but I think when I'm really working with my patients, some of the key muscles are uh, hip extensors, hip abductors, hamstrings. I love working with hamstrings because I think they are an important component of gait cycle. And then we're working with gastroc and TA. So I think sometimes when we talk about these, that's the majority. But I was reading this very interesting article and they talked about, we have two limbs. We talk about three major joints during a gait cycle, hip, knee, ankle. But we forget about two other joints which are your mid-tarsal joints and then tarsophalangeal joints. And I think those two joints are really important in mobility. And then same thing about muscles. We talk about this big bulky muscles. We talk about hip flexors, extensors, abductors. We talk about knee, quadriceps, and we talk about hamstrings. We talk about ankle. But there are 28 muscles that help us during the gait cycle. And when we are doing treatments with these patients, are we addressing all 28 muscles? So there's some things to think about. Uh, this, I just wanted to put in some range of motion, uh, which is during the normal gait cycle. So how do we assess? And I think observational gait analysis, that's a gold standard. Um, and we all know that stance phase is majority of the time, 60% versus swing phase is only about 40%. So when we think about gait assessment, there is two different ways in which we can do it. Kinetics and then kinematics. As I said before, kinetics is not something that we are able to do um, in our day-to-day -day operations in the clinics. Um, they need to have labs and sophisticated equipments to be able to do those. But the data from there really helps us understand the gait cycle. So if you have a chance and we are really struggling with a patient, that information really helps us. And there are a few uh, devices out which are more portable which are out there that if your clinic is uh, interested in, could definitely invest into something like that. And then gait kinematics. I think that's what we do as physical therapists. We are really looking at the temporal and the spatial characteristics of gait. So when I'm looking for gait assessments, I'm also looking at the vertical support of the body at different phases of the gait. So usually the vertical support of the body in stance, it's mainly hip and knee extensors because that really helps us with our vertical support. Then during our mid stance, that's when we have contralateral hip abductors. And then during the other part of the gait cycle, we have this ankle plantar flexor muscles, which really help us gain that height. And if your ankle plantar flexors are either uh, contracted or spastic or weak, 
then we may lose that vertical support time during the gate cycle. Uh, there are lots of different gate assessment tools out there. Uh, we can just do simple observational gate analysis, but uh, in terms of temporal and spatial uh, information, we can use uh, different kinds of gate velocity. So traditionally, we always use 10 meter walk test, but there is also a 25 foot walk test, which is more validated for patients with MS. Uh, you could do a four meter walk test. And um, I was just reading up on some of these. So in this pandemic that we are living in right now, we are thinking about how to treat patients with COVID. And I was talking to a couple of therapists who are inpatient and I was asking them, what kind of gait assessments do you use? And they said they are restricted to be using any of this 10 meter walk or 25 foot walk because they can't bring these patients outside their room. They have to be isolated. So they have been using four meter walk test. So just in their room and just trying to move four meters, actually one of the therapists told me she only uses two meter. So whatever it is, but all we're trying to do is trying to get some kind of these temporal spatial information because as your patient is getting better, this is what is going to give you further information on outcomes. Uh, other standardized outcome tools are FIM, you could have a DGI, FGA, uh, the Emory functional uh, ambulation profile, six minute walk test if you're really looking at endurance. Um, and then you can also have instrumented gait analysis. So going back on these videos again, and just listening to this webinar, see how that has changed on how you looked at the gait. This time, are you looking more at, is this patient using any of the rocker systems? Is this patient using that vertical gravitational vector forces? And where is that gravitational vector forces landing on her ankle? And is that helping her with that knee extension or hip flexion or the ankle motion? Uh, also looking at in the initial part of stance or mid stance or terminal stance, are we getting any components of those gait cycle in terms of ankle motion or hip or knee motion? So some of it we are getting, but some of it we are not getting. And then by looking at it this way, this is where your ideas for treatments stem in and you start prioritizing what treatments you want to use for this patient. So thank you for your attention and open to any questions you may have. Awesome, thank you, Nassim. That was absolutely fantastic in terms of just really helping to clearly break down the different elements of the gait cycle. And, you know, it's, it's always good for, for the veteran and, you know, NCSs, I think it's a great review. Um, but I think also for, for some of the people who are a little newer to the field, um, I think this is gonna be an extremely helpful resource for kind of helping to understand how you would approach this. Mm -hmm. uh, did want to ask you just a few questions if we have a few minutes. Absolutely. All right. Um, you know, one of the things you mentioned was your observational gait analysis system. Could you talk a little bit more about like what specifically are the elements of that that you would analyze and, and what you would document there? Yeah, that's a good question. So with observational gait analysis, you can do it in multiple different ways. And um, I love the world we live in right now, technology. So most of the patients, they have smartphone and I love to borrow their smartphone and I take a video of them walking and it helps me in multiple ways. One, I don't have to worry about HIPAA. So it's always on patient's phone. But once I record it, because sometimes you know how patients might get tired. So if they did walk one way and if I keep making them walk the second time and the third time, there might be some different ways that they're walking in. So if I have a video, I can sit back and I can go. And sometimes I do the video in a slow motion mode, which even helps me more because then sometimes what I do is I pause that video. So you know how I said about kinetics and we need to have labs and we need to have those kind of things. But if you have a video and you pause it at a certain point and then just with your finger or whatever you can, I look at that gravitational vector line and I see where the body is and then where the foot is and how we can work with this. So this is just one part where I look at it. But my other big thing is I show this video to my patients. And there's a lot of research or literature in terms of patients perceived pattern of walking mm -hmm. and how it changes and how they think what they're doing versus what we see what they are doing. So it helps the patient see, oh, and sometimes when I show it to my patient, my patient is like, oh, I walk that way. They, they don't think about it that way. So this helps me with the motivation factor 
And this helps me with that buying in factor of that patient and wanting to work with it. So it helps me with that salience of uh, neuroplasticity. Uh, the other ways I use is uh, maybe have a mirror. Uh, most times I use like a marked walkway. So I have the spatial characteristics already built in and then uh, I might just time them. And as I said, um, I tend to go by 10 meters, but again, uh, sometimes I'm not able to. So whatever distance I get, I try to get that gate speed in. Uh, I try to keep standardized. So if I use something on that first day, that's what we're going to use. If they work with a cane, that's how we're going to do it. So we try to really mimic what we do on eval. And I'm very, like, I'm, I really try to document exactly what the scenario was. So when we retest them, we can see the differences. And how frequently do you do those reassessments? Is it every session or is it more spaced out? So that's a very good question too. And it really depends on the patient. Uh, I think depends is a really good word <laughs> in physical therapy. I think we use it more often. Um, but I, I like to do it weekly if I can. Okay. And that's where I say is, even though it's not the standardized way, but most times gait training is incorporated during treatment. And so when they walk, we try to do something different. And we say, okay, let's look at your gait speed now. Now this time walk this way. And now let's look at the gait speed. So I think it's a really good rewarding uh, thing for the patients to see. So I tend to use it more often. But in terms of just documenting, I go by those least standards that I'm, I have to do, right? I don't have that much time. So usually two weeks okay. in terms of formal okay. assessment. Great. Mm -hmm. One of the other questions I had, you, you talked a lot about the, the three main components of gait. So, you know, the weight acceptance, the single limb support, the limb advancement. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk about some specific either exercises or cues that you might use with patients to kind of address deficits in each of these three subtasks of gait? Yes, and that's another good question. Um, there are lots of exercises. Mm -hmm. And so this is where I always feel is if somebody wants to work on gait, I can give them like 50 different exercises. Um, it just, we have so many exercises. But then the problem is a patient might come to me and say, oh, I have like hey, exercises that I was given. And I'll say, okay, bring them in. I'm expecting to see like a one page or a two page. And people bring binders. And they have like page after page after page because this person might have Parkinson's and have been living with Parkinson's for like five years. And they might have seen a number of therapists in that five years. And every therapist has given them some exercises to do. Mm -hmm. So now I have this patient, he's like so good about exercise. And patients, some patients are really good about doing the exercises diligently. I love them. Uh, so, but they're so thorough about every exercise that it becomes stressful for them. So I think my first key component is really find out where is the biggest problem. And the patient may have problem in all three components, but figure out where's the biggest problem which you would address that can cause the most outcome change. Mm -hmm. So in terms of weight acceptance, my biggest thing is stability. So I do a lot of work in terms of hip extensors and being able to put that weight on that ankle. Are they able to bring that leg forward to put weight on it? Sometimes I don't even have them put that leg forward and weight on it. I might just have them have two legs about six inches apart and just have them stand and just see if they can rock slightly forward or back just by that weight acceptance part. Is that hip extensors kicking in? Um, it could be standing for 30 seconds. It could be standing for two minutes. Mm -hmm. The second is the mid stance or the single limb support time. That's when I do a lot of times where I'll take a book or a block. It could be half an inch, it could be one inch, but I'm trying to make the patient have the other foot on a block and then put one foot down on the floor. So it's kind of, it's not exactly single limb stance, but it kind of mimics that mid stance a little bit. And even over here, all you're going to do is weight shift forward and back. So see if you can get some dorsiflexion over here or that TPL advancement over here or not. Uh, if the patient is able to do it on that book or one inch, I go up to two or three inches step stool. Uh, for some of my patients, I go up to 17 or 18 inches. So I go really high. Because again, if one foot is down here and if the other foot is able to go reach that high and come down, then that puts in a little part of that single limb support time. So it takes some time for somebody to pick up this foot from the floor and go up to that 20 inches or 18 inches. So I, I go really, really high. And it also allows them to have that typical advancement. Mm 
And then in the propulsive force or the swing force, a lot of times I like to do is lunge exercises. So you have your one foot on the ground and then your other foot is taking as big a step forward as they can. Um, if you can just take a simple step, you can start over there. Um, and then I put hurdles down. So if something like a cone or like a hurdle or a step or a box, whatever you can find, because now that really helps this patient to understand that my one foot is on the ground, I get through the mid stance and I need to get that terminal stance and free swing. That's what is going to allow me to get that other foot because we are really looking for that propulsive force to take them forward. Right. Um, and then I think the last one was the, did we talk through the um, limb advancement? So for the limb advancement in the swing phase. So this happens when patients really don't have the power or the muscle strength in hip flexors and then the knee flexors. And that's why I like to work with hamstrings quite a bit. Mm -hmm. And so you can have different ways in which you can do it. You can start with just passively moving if the patient just does not have that force generation. Uh, a lot of times I use a treadmill because with the treadmill, it's easier for me to just sit and be able to give them assistance to do this. I have also used electrical stimulation. So if they really are not able to generate those forces, then use electrical stimulation to do it. Um, but other than that, um, sometimes just even using hurdles, like again, small things so that the patient is able to pick up that foot and bring it forward. A lot of times what happens is there is two different kinds of population. One population who doesn't have enough energy or force production power to generate the momentum. But the other population is where they have just enough force and power, but they just choose not to use it. So they just kind of drag that foot like just right around. They don't get into the cycle of picking up and coming down, picking up and coming down. So this is when we really try to use uneven ground and really give hurdles or sometimes I even put just weights. So like a dumbbell or just an ankle weight on the floor, but it just gives them a cue that I have to lift my leg over this. And then that brings in the cycle of doing it. And simple marching exercises, I think that really helps with that as well. Makes sense. Um, you know, I think one of the things that I really like about this talk is, you know, it really does a great job of identifying uh, kind of the biologically correct mechanisms and, and the, you know, the mechanics that we rely on to help us walk more efficiently. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm wondering, can you talk a little bit more about why, why it's so important to encourage a return to these biologically appropriate strategies um, in, in our patients, you know, to make sure that they get back to these biologically correct walking path patterns? Now, that's another really good question. And sometimes we debate, should we do that or not? Um, and I'll give you both the sides of the debate. So one side that I really think about is, I like to go back as much as I can, but my goal is energy conservation. Mm -hmm. So if I said, you know, that we walk about 5,000 steps a day or 10,000 steps a day, we don't get tired towards the end of the day because the way our limbs are advancing and we're using the rockers and we're using our gravitational vector, our muscles don't have to be in that on category at all times. And that helps us conserve energy and move faster and more. But if for some reason I am not able to use my rocker system, I'm not able to use my gravitational vector system, now my muscles have to work three times, four times, five times, a lot many times higher than what they should be using. And now I might only walk 100 meters and I'm tired. Mm -hmm. So if we can get that gait pattern as close to using these mechanics to help and we are able to conserve energy, we are making that gait pattern efficient in terms of time, speed, and in terms of distance as well. So that's that's a big thing about trying to go as close as possible. The other side of the debate is, if your patients are not able to come into that perfect gait training pattern that we want, and some people will never be able to do that. Like I have a patient with stroke who doesn't have anything in their ankle. They're wearing a solid AFO that solid AFO is not going to allow any of the ankle mechanics during the stance phase of the gait. How can I go as close to using all these gravitational vectors or rocker system? It, it just won't be, we won't be able to do that. So in those cases then, allow them to do the best the patient can. And we really try to get, so if a patient's goal is, I need to work with 
increased speed or more distance, then that's where we really try to do those task specific exercises. And now we're not really working on normalizing the gait pattern, but what we are working on is making it efficient in the way the patient's presentation is. So it goes both ways. Excellent. Nassim, thank you so much for, for this fantastic talk. I think it's been, it's been really fun to do this with you. Um, and we really appreciate you taking the time to, to present this for us. Um, so thank you. Um, and to all our viewers, we hope you tune in with us again next week. And have a great week, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you.